Mm. Any questions about the material? Yeah. What is the commutator? Yes, right. So we will study them today. Uh, they will have. Uh, they actually will have significant meaning for measurement process. Okay, but uh, I haven't explained that material yet. So I just posted the lecture notes because I was asked to post the notes beforehand. Right. So that's what I did. So that you will be, I guess, more comfortable with material. Uh, but uh, there is no need to understand everything I posted because, uh, well, we haven't uh, looked at this yet. Did you look at the notes? Yeah. So there is a definition AB minus BA there, right? So. Essentially, the operators, uh, they are objects that, uh, in contrast to numbers, like with numbers, if you multiply 5 by 3 and then subtract 3 by 5, you get 0, right? So that's something that we study in the primary school, that uh, numbers, they commute. If you write that this expression is the same as uh, 5 square uh, comma 3 square brackets, then this is so called commutator is 0 for numbers. But now if instead of numbers we put operators A and B, then it turns out that A, B is not equal to B, A generally. I haven't specified what A and B are. So some operators actually A, B equals to B, A. It's, it's the same as in real life. If you do two operations, then you may have operations that are, well, it's just, a, it's, a, it's not important which order you go and say, what would be the example? Well, say you prepare to have a tea, 5 o'clock tea, right? So you go get the dessert and you make a tea, right? So you can do it in a different order. You can first make a tea and go for the dessert, or you can first go for the dessert and make a tea. So once you uh, have done two operations, right, in any order, you will have tea and the dessert, and you can have your 5 o'clock tea, right? Now, uh, there are also operations that uh, order of which cannot be changed without changing the result, right? So if you say make a soup or cook something, so say for the soup you take vegetables, meat, you, you wash them, right? Then you start boiling them, that sort of stuff. So now imagine if you uh, reverse the operations, if you put all the vegetables and meat first boil them and then start washing them, so the result will be completely disastrous and different, of course, than from the first. So the same with the operators, they operate, and this is like operations, it's like making soup, you can split the op uh, this whole procedure into the operations, and it's important what is the order of operations to get the result you want, right? So. Now, why is this all important for quantum mechanics? It's because, as I stated in the notes, uh, if we want to know about object, cup of coffee or baseball or volleyball or whatever, classical car, any classical object, then we would like to, if we want to investigate what the object is, we would like to know its position, its velocity or momentum, its all the properties we can get, right? So that's how we uh, get the knowledge about the object, about anyone, creating a dossier on someone, right? So you kind of trying to get the information, as much information as possible. Now, when it comes to the quantum objects, you also would like to well, get as much information as possible if you want to investigate electron, for example, right? So you want to know the energy, position, momentum, that sort of stuff. Now, the trouble in quantum mechanics is that 
we know in order to be able to say with certainty what is the position or what is the momentum or what is the energy, any property, you, you name it, uh, then what is the condition for, for that so, so that we know the property with certainty. What is the condition? Yeah. Uh, the operator of the property that you're looking at has to operate on the function so that it's the, the eigenfunction is the uh, it, the function is an eigenfunction of the operator. That's right. Yeah. So that is very crucial point. I want everyone to know if you are still hesitant about this, please uh, look for help. And uh, because this is one of the most important components of this class. If you don't understand what was just said, that means you missed the first part. There will be troubles later in midterm or finals, like really like try to understand because this is very important information. Because this is the key point, the key value of the quantum mechanics, it can predict what will be certain property of the quantum object and what are the conditions when we can measure this uh, well, property with certainty, right? And the condition is that any property, let's call it O, has an associated operator O with a hat, right? And then any wave function, uh, any system has a wave function, right? And then the test we're making is whether the operator, when it operates on the wave function, gives us back a constant multiplied by the same wave function. In other words, if you do this operation, and you divide this by the wave function, you must get the constant, right? That just follows from this. If you don't get the constant, then that means the function that you are dealing with is not an eigenfunctional operator. That means what? If we measure, the, we still can measure property. That Don't make mistake, we, we still can measure property. It's just what's going to be the result of that. So there's more than one possible result. Outcomes, there. right? So, and we, quantum mechanics can only predict the probabilities of those outcomes and what are these outcomes will be. Uh, it just comes out of the eigenfunctions for that operator, right? And the outcomes of the measurements are always eigenfunctions of the operator, right? And the probabilities are given by the coefficient squared and the coefficients are coming from the expansion of the function in a as a linear combination of uh, eigenfunctions for the operator, right? So that's the whole scheme. That scheme, you should be really proficient at that, that scheme because this is the, the, the key scheme for the predicting what will be the result of any measurement in quantum mechanics, right? All right, good. So now, today we will consider the case where we have uh, more than one operators or more than more than one property, say if we have O1 and O2, right? And they of course will have O1 operator and O2 operator. Then the question is, if we have a wave function or the system with a wave function psi, when can we measure these properties and simultaneously have a certain answer or certain result of our measurement, right? So certain doesn't mean that we do measurement and we get a number, right? Certain means that if we have 100 identical systems and we do hundreds of measurements, they should all give us the same result because they are done on the identical systems systems that are described by this wave function, right? So in classical mechanics, if we look at the same car or this identical copies of the car, identical means it has the same position, same momentum, and we measure position momentum for 100 identical cars or, yeah, essentially copies of the same car, then we'll get the same result. That's in classical mechanics, no question there. In quantum mechanics, it all depends whether the wave function is eigenfunction of the operator or not. Because if it's not an eigenfunction of the operator, you can get 100 different results, right? According to this second scheme, right? When the, when the function is not an eigenfunction of operator, then you get all these numbers which are 
uh, possible with certain probabilities. And uh, if you do hundreds of measurements, uh, they, they may give you 100 different results. Now, if we're talking about two properties, the, again, the question is when, uh, when do we get the certain result? And the obvious answer is when we have O1 psi divided by psi giving us an uh, eigenvalue, right? And at the same time, we have O2 acting on the psi divided by psi giving us lambda 2, right? So in other words, our function is an eigenfunction for two of those operators at the same time, right? So that's the condition. When we can measure with certainty properties corresponding to O1 and O2, you can think of them, if you want example, say O1 can be position and O2 can be momentum, right? And if you want to measure position and momentum, your wave function must be an eigenfunction of the position operator and at the same time eigenfunction of the momentum operator, right? And today we'll see that uh, whether this is true or not depends on the commutators of two operators, right? So the commutator of O1, O2, whether it's zero, uh, whether it's zero or not, will depend. Uh, will will define whether this is true or not. Okay, and go, uh, kind of giving you out the result right away. I can say that if the commutator of two operators is zero, then there is a chance that the wave function that you are dealing with can be an eigenfunction of uh, two operators at the same time. If the operators do not commute or in other words, uh, if the commutator is non-zero, then there is no way the wave function that you are dealing with is an eigenfunction of two operators at the same time. Okay, that's why these commutators are so important for the measurement process of uh, two or more operators, because you can generalize this to more than two operators, to say 10 operators, then the question whether you can find a wave function that is eigenfunction of all 10 operators boils down to whether all possible commutators of all 10 operators, so like uh, what, 10 times 9 divided by well, 45 pairs essentially, right? So 45 pairs of operators uh, will be zero, right? In that condition, you have a chance that the wave function isn't an uh, eigenfunction of all operators at the same time, okay? So commutators are important, and they're important because uh, they will tell us whether we can measure uh, two properties at the same time, right? Just by looking at operators. And this is relatively easy to calculate, this uh, commutator, right? Now, in order to illustrate this, let's just do a very simple example. And the example will be, O1 is almost like momentum, but with all these unnecessary constants. Let's say O1 is derivative and O2 is x squared, right? So essentially O1 acting on the function of x will differentiate function of x, right? O2, when it acts on the function of x, will multiply it by x squared, right? And the question is, all right, so what is the commutator of O1, O2? Now you can try to just uh, formulate O1, O2 minus O2, O1 and uh, figure out what will be the commutator. But my suggestion is always to use a function because the commutator O1, O2 is actually an also, also an operator, right? Uh, we can call it O3 or any other letter, doesn't really matter. But the point here is that commutator of two operators is a still operator because what we do, we operate O1, O2 and, and then on some function essentially, right? It's an operator that acts on some function. And uh, the question is, 
what this operator, right? And it turns out if you skip this function, it just becomes harder to keep track of the right algebra. You, you will see what I mean in a moment. Let's just do my way first, and then we can try to be more adventurous when we know the result. All right, so let's say we, we need O1, O2, right? So what is this? Uh, D over DX, this is O1, uh, multiplied by O2, which is X squared, multiplied by function. Well, they act on the function, right? So this is O2. And we subtract from that, this is this part, we subtract from that X squared, D over DX, uh, function of X, right? So uh, this is O2, this is O1, and this is this part, right? And so what do we get? Well, according to rules of calculus, this is now a new function, x squared times f of, f of x, right? And so derivative of that uh, product is the derivative of the first function uh, times the f of x plus the derivative of the second times the first one, right? So it's 2x, f of x, then plus uh, x square f prime. Prime here is the derivative of f, right? And uh, minus, here we have x square f derivative, right? So now we can do some cancellation. These terms are the same, right? It's x square f prime. And so they cancel each other because they're with different signs. And the result we got is 2x multiplied by f of x. So that means, what is the commutator? Hmm? Anyone? 2x. 2x, that's right. So f of x was something from the beginning there. And so we don't put it in the definition of what commutator is, because what, uh, well, commutator by definition is operator act, uh, that acts on f, right? And so we can think of this as a result of action of 2x on f of x, right? And so it's a little bit like uh, considering dimensionality in physics. So this is then 2x is the commutator of... Uh, d over dx with uh, x squared, right, equals 2x. That's the result. And in homework that I already posted, you actually will have uh, lots of examples to practice calculating commutators, OK? So any questions about uh, this example? Yeah. So in this situation, because it's not zero, this is not going to be applicable to both of those. Um, so so the fact that it's not zero means that you, uh, well, these two operators, they don't share uh, eigenfunctions, OK? And we'll prove that as a more formal theorem in a moment. Uh, it's just uh, essentially if you measure a property associated with the derivative and if you measure property associated with x squared, then there's no way you, ha you can have a function that is an eigenfunction of both d over dx and x squared, right? So that's a simple example. But before we go further, uh, let me just show you a common mistake if you, if you decide to be a little bit uh, say faster and uh, you decide to skip the f there and just consider the commutator, right? So d over dx x square, right? So what is it? And we just do d over dx x square minus x square d over dx. And we won't put any function. Then naturally d over dx uh, differentiate the x square, right? And the result uh, similarly may be 2x uh, minus x square d over dx, right? What we forgot in this derivation is that actually d over dx acts on x squared and acts on whatever is following x squared, okay? So that, that was harder to forget if you have an f function, okay? So this is a wrong answer, of course. 
because uh, the, the mistake here is that we acted on the with d over dx on x square, but we didn't leave d over dx acting on whatever is following x square, because x square is just an op operator, right? So there is a function. You, of course, can try to do all this mental algebra accurately. It's just my suggestion would be to, uh, well, to, to put the function instead. Because you can potentially uh, just do this part carefully with 2x plus not forgetting about the d over dx. It kind of goes through and uh, appears on this side. And then you will get d over dx from there. And then cancellation, you get the right result even without function. But for that, you need to remember that d over dx acts not only on x, not only on any functional part, but goes further than that, right? So it's easier just to put the function. That's the bottom line, OK? Now there is a, OK, now more physical example. If we have momentum and position, example two, right? Then this is a very important op uh, commutator. Uh, because uh, we can say that uh, this is something that uh, is very well known and uh, bothered people about quantum mechanics because it's essentially we will see that this commutator is non-zero. That means you cannot measure position and momentum at the same time, which is disturbing uh, considering the classical uh, intuition. So this commutator is i h bar with minus sign. And the way you can get to this result is, uh, well, just considering explicitly minus i h bar d over dx uh, x times function minus uh, x minus i h bar d over dx times function, right? And again, here we use uh, a rule of differentiation of the product, right? And we have i h bar d over d. Uh, the first derivative is just one. And then uh, the second one will be uh, 2 minus as it gives us plus i h bar a constant you can take it and then okay so these two parts cancel and the answer is uh, minus i h bar multiplied by f that means that minus i h bar is a result and is a commutator okay One thing to remember is that uh, if you have a commutator of A and B, right, then it's minus commutator of B and A. So that means if you, instead of commutator of P, X, consider commutator of X, P, then it will be, instead of minus I, H bar, I, H bar, okay? Just mind the sign. OK, now few, well, one actually, exciting theorem will go two ways. So the theorem is essentially says that if two operators commute, then they have a common system of eigenfunctions, and also if two operators have a common system of eigenfunctions, they commute. So more in a more mathematical language, I guess you can say that two operator, uh, only if and only if uh, uh, two operators commute, they have the same system of eigenfunction. Yeah. Now does that have to mean all the eigenfunctions have to commute or just one? Eigenfunctions always commute. 
Let me rephrase the question. Yeah. So you're saying that yeah, if two operators have you basically have an operator times a function and gives you an eye and you find out it's an eigenfunction. function. Uh -huh. Another operator tells you and you multiply by the exact same uh, function, it will give you an eigenfunction function as well. But if that's the only function out of a whole wide range of functions possible. That no, that's not what theorem says. Okay, so what theorem says is that if two operators commute, if say A and B commute, all right. So this is the first. Let's let's split it. Uh, there is the first part and the second part, and I uh, I will start with the second, the proof because it's easier. But let me formulate the first one, the first part. So if two operators commute, that means uh, there is exist. A system of eigenfunctions like this, right? There exists set of functions psi one, psi n that uh, that satisfies these two equations. Now your question was some arbitrary function. If it's an eigenfunction of A, is it an eigenfunction of B then? Yeah, and, then say there's a and the answer is no. It's not necessarily the case. Okay. Uh, although there is a high chance that this is true, but I'll show you the example wh where where it's not true, okay. and it is related to the degenerate case where um, where essentially. Uh, this eigenfunction of A can uh, be actually, uh, uh, well, can be represented by the eigenfunctions of A, which correspond to the same, two eigenfunctions of A corresponding to the same eigenvalue, right? So arbitrary function psi, which is an eigenfunction of A, not necessarily an eigenfunction of B. This is not what theorem says. Theorem says that there is a system the complete set, if we are talking about observables, which needs to be chosen. And that set will be a, a simultaneous eigenfunctions of A and B. But arbitrary function, which is an eigenfunction of A, may not be an eigenfunction of B. Because of that choice, you need somewhere to make if the sum of eigenvalues are degenerate. So this is a little bit more complicated uh, situation. I will illustrate it so you will understand what I mean. But just take it literally, what I say, and be careful with words. So essentially, the statement is, if two operators commute, that means, there, like in mathematical language, uh, there, uh, there's this symbol that uh, says that there exists a set of eigenfunctions so that this is true, right? Also, another point here is that the uh, eigenvalues uh, they, uh, they can be, of course, different, right? Because they're coming from different operators. Uh, there exists a set which is an uh, eigenset for two operators at the same time. Now, the second part of the theorem is the, the same statement but in the opposite direction, uh, which says that if there exists such set, if we start with this, let's say we have a set of functions then this means that two operators will commute. Okay, these are two statements, and the initial kind of statement is different in the first versus the second one. Uh, essentially, if A is correct, then B, and here it's if B correct, then A. So that means these two like as a conclusion, if when we prove both of these statements, that means actually uh, the commutator condition is equivalent fully to the condition that there is a set of eigenfunctions. Right. It's essentially, in math, uh, they talk about sufficient and necessary conditions. If we prove this, that means that uh, uh, having the commutators being zero is necessary for having the eigenstates. And then 
but not sufficient. And this is the opposite. So it is sufficient to have uh, eigenfunctions so for the uh, two operators to commute. OK, so let's start with the second because it's, it's much easier. It turns out that if you have a set of eigenfunctions for two operators, then they will necessarily commute. Sorry, yeah. So if they don't commute, then that means there's no set of eigenfunctions. That's right. Okay. Right. So there is only, only in the condition when they commute, there will be a set. Okay, but you, uh, in some situations this set is obvious. In some situations this set requires some choices. And uh, that second case, more complicated case, is when there are degenerate eigenvalues. And we will talk about that. In the case of kinetic energy and momentum, it turns out that sometimes, yeah, you need to be more careful. Anyway, so let's start with simple. What does it mean that A, B, so we're talking about the second case first. Okay, so we have a set of eigenfunctions, and we want to prove that A and B uh, the commutator is zero. That's what we want to prove. But what does this mean? That means that A, B commutator is an operator where if you put an, any random function f, what do you get? You get B, A, F. Right, so if this is true, then what will be the result for any function f? Oh, uh, zero. zero, right? So all we need to prove to prove this is that if we take any random function f and we act with a commutator, the result will be zero. Okay? So if we prove this, that necessarily will mean that a, b commutator is zero. Because we will not restrict what our f function, we, we, we won't say, okay, f is x squared, let's prove it. No, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep f completely arbitrary, any function, any function you like. And the proof will work. So now for any function f, what is true is that we can expand it in the linear combination of eigenfunctions, the one that we have, uh, which are eigenfunctions for a and b simultaneously. Right? We're talking about observables, and they always have this um, complete sets of functions. So complete set by definition means that these guys are so powerful that in their, uh, in their majority, like they can describe any function f as linear combination accurately. So there is equal sign, not approximately, but equal sign. For that you may need infinite number of them, but we can work with infinities, right? So it's it's just this. This is true for any arbitrary f. You change f, the coefficients will be different, but the set is the same. Okay. Now let's see what if we if we have this, what will be the result of a b acting on f, and the result of uh, b a acting on f. We will see that the results of a b and b a acting on f will be the same, and that's very easy to show. So let's say when for that instead of f we'll put the expansion right and so the expansion cn psi n and then we'll act with b first on psi n know how b acts on psi n it creates the it, it kind of adds the coefficient right so it adds this bn and then we act with A operator, right? So these are all operators. Sometimes I forget to put the hats, right? So A acts on the, well, it will skip the coefficients because those are numbers. A mainly acts on the, on the function, right? And we know how it acts on the function. It will, cre it will add another, another constant, A n, right? C n, B n, A n. Psi n. And these guys are just numbers, so you can write them in uh, what? Six possible ways? 
right? Permutation of all three in any, you know, it's three factorial. So you can write A and B and C N, or you can write C and B and A N, or you can write B and C and A N, and so on and so forth. Six different ways, they're all the same. Right? So now you can kind of already see where this is going because now we act with A first and then with B and uh, do the same expansion. Right? Say C N psi N. And when A acts first, it will create, uh, it will, the B is here, right? It will bring the A N. And then, then B acts and it will give us uh, expansion with uh, A N, B N, Psi N, right? But this and this, they're exactly the same because we're talking about numbers and functions and we can permute them in multiplication uh, in any way we want, right? So we proved that AB of F and BA of F, they're exactly the same. So when you, if you subtract AB from BA, you get zero, right? So we proved this, and that means we proved this. So, and we, the only thing we needed for this is that there is a common set of eigenfunctions that we can use to expand any arbitrary function, right? And then the rest is just a simple algebra. Okay, that's the second part of the theorem. Now, the first part is a little bit trickier, uh, but we still can prove it. I'll prove it for the case where eigenvalues of two operators are non-degenerate. So that means, what do, what do I mean by this? And an is not equal to bn. So if there is a function psi n, and there is function psi uh, k, and they are eigenfunctions of, say, operator a, non-degenerate case means that there is uh, that corresponding eigenvalues, this one has a small n and this one has a small k, right? So non-degenerate means a n cannot be equal to a k. This is non-degenerate. We saw for a particle in the box, three dimensions, that uh, there was a, operator A was a Hamiltonian and uh, its eigenvalues were energies, we saw that there are some levels where you can have different functions, but eigenvalues will be the same. No, don't remember? Yeah, flip a couple of pages. <laughs> right? So it's, the picture was like this, this is 1, 1, 1, this is 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, Oof. One to one, right? So these are different functions, but the energies are the same, right? So this would be a degenerate case, and we will not consider that because, yeah, well, uh, whoever wants to consider it, we can talk about it, but it's just a little bit more involved in logic. So for the first, uh, for the first uh, kind of introduction into the subject, uh, this is not necessary. So we will consider a non-degenerate case, and the same is true for the B operator. So uh, we, we agree that all eigenfunctions which are different eigenfunctions, they produce different eigenvalues for A and B. And now let's prove that if A and B, they commute, then necessarily uh, there will be a common set of eigenfunctions, okay? So our starting point is A, B, they commute, right? And, uh, well, okay. So then we, well, A and B are operators. Uh, there is nothing special in saying that, well, any operator has an eigenfunctions, uh, set of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. It's just we yet need to prove that the eigenfunctions uh, will be the same. But we always can write, and I put the different symbols here, size and phi's, we always can write that operator A 
has its own eigenfunctions and operator B has its own eigenfunctions. So uh, this is completely general statement. And what I want to show is that if this condition is satisfied, then phi's will be uh, proportional to size, right? So the proportional because uh, any multiplication by any number actually doesn't really change the fact that the eigenfunction is an eigenfunction. All right, it only, yeah, it's, it's not going to change anything. Now, we'll prove that. Now, how do we prove that? So, if we consider A commutator B acting on psi n, and psi n is chosen to be an eigenfunction of A. Let's consider what is the result of uh, operating with the commutator onto the psi n. We write, we kind of know from the beginning that operator is zero. Uh, this uh, commutator is zero, so the result must be zero. Uh, we know that, but let's see uh, what this expression will break down into. So it will be a b acting on psi n minus uh, b. A acting on psi n, and we know what this is, right? So this is, uh, let's say, A B psi n minus, we have a constant A n B psi n, right? And we know that this is zero. What does this mean? Uh, it actually means that if we think now about b psi n as a function, right? So that function is an eigenfunction of a operator again, with the eigenvalue which is exactly the same as the original eigenvalue of the original function psi n. Okay. So what does that mean? We had a condition of non-degeneracy, so that means uh, we have function psi n and we have function b psi n. And those two functions give the same eigenvalue for the a, or well, they must be the same, up to a constant. Right? So what does this mean is that it means that b, when it acts on psi n, gives us some constant times psi n. Well, this constant can be moved. Huh? It's one over, well, yeah, well, one over constant is a constant, yeah, yeah. right? So I just probably better to put it here, right? So to skip the step. And so that's what we got, essentially, from, from this condition. And the condition that a. Uh, only has one eigenfunction corresponding to one eigenvalue, right? So we got the result that says that, oh, psi n actually is an eigenfunction of b as well. Because this is the condition like this one, right? We act with b on the function and we get the same function times constant. So now we will call this constant bn. And we got essentially the equation from here is that the b acting on psi n gives us b n psi n. And that means since the, this, this is essentially mean that uh, the psi n's are the same as phi n's. They are the same. Okay? So that concludes the theorem. And shows that uh, if your if your two operators commute, then the system of eigenfunctions will be the same. All right. Sorry. But yeah. But why why can't uh, the a n equal to b n? Or why why does the, you have why do you have to have the case of non degeneracy? Because you just said there the constant is equal to b n, right? Oh, okay. But the constant is one over a n. Well, let me illustrate the example with the degeneracy. Just uh, it kind of explain uh, the answer to your question with an example. Um, 
So let's consider kinetic energy and uh, momentum operator. Okay. And so let's say A operator is kinetic energy, which is P squared divided by 2m. And B operator is just momentum. Uh, first question, do they commute? Huh? No. So P in N power, P in M power, whatever N and M are, always will be zero because P N times P M minus P M P N, right? So this is the same operator we're talking about. And that's why it's always going to be, you can write it like P, n to, uh, P in the power of n plus m minus P to the power of m plus n. And the powers are the same, so you get zero. Here we have power, first power, here we have second power. So by this general theorem for any n and m, you can choose any. Any power of one operator commutes with any power of that same operator because the operators are the same, right? So it's, it's just what do we mean by P and PM? It means we have P times P N times, right? And then we have P times P M time. So what's the difference? Do we group them like this and this or, uh, or N first and then M? Right, so the sum of this operator, uh, the sum of uh, uh, sum of p operators uh, is n plus m. So the action of this product will be exactly the same. So t and p they commute, they commute operators, right? Uh, because the constant doesn't really mean anything, and uh, p square. Right, so this is zero. So according to our theorem, there is a, there is a common set of eigenfunctions, right? And now, now, I will show that, let me take an eigenfunction of the T operator, special one. Say, we already know this will work, and px divided by, I think, 2, so that we won't have any uh, kind of uh, normalization factor, right? So normalization is square root of 2 divided by L, and if L is 2, then there is no normalization, it's 1, right? So very convenient. So the functions are defined at the range between 0 and 2, and they are like this. So this type of functions, they are we this kind of particle in the box functions. T operates on them. We know what the result will be is n square pi square h bar square divided by two m l squared is um, two squared is four. So we have this type of result, right? C sine function n pi x divided by two. Okay. So this is an example, a valid example of eigenfunction for the T. Now, is it an eigenfunction for the P? According to theorem, it should be, right? But you can easily see that it's not because P is minus I H bar uh, D over DX, right? So you differentiate sine function, you get cosine function. So this is not an eigenfunction of the P. But it's an eigenfunction of t, but they commute, so what's going on? <laughs> Quantum mechanics. Uh, it's not part of them, but could, you, could you change the cosine to a sine, though, using Euler's form? Sure, you can, use, uh, you can change cosine to sine, but then you need, a fa you need a pi over 2 phase, right? And so you will not get, the, you will not get what you want, essentially. It's still going to be a different function. Okay, so now the question is, is theorem wrong? Um, is, 
how many pieces do we have? We have a theorem, we have this, right, uh, which seems like a solid thing, like P, uh, P acting on the sine uh, and pi x divided by 2. It should be, it should be definitely proportional to cosine, uh, maybe with some coefficient, but uh, some coefficient alpha, say. So that's why we can say it's equal to. Uh, but essentially that shows that uh, this is not an eigenfunction of P. So this is the one piece, theorem is another piece, and the third piece where I convinced you that the, com uh, the operators commute, right? So where did it go wrong? That's right, so that is actually the crucial observation that uh, the theorem says that there is a set of functions which is common for two operators. It doesn't say that you pick any function which is an eigenfunction of one operator, it will be an eigenfunction of another operator, right? And so that magic set in this case would be the exponents actually. Uh, these exponents, if you differentiate them, they will be an eigenfunctions of P. And if you double differentiate them, they will be eigenfunctions of t. It's just the sine function is a special case where we take two exponents at the same time. And the sine is, according to the earlier expression, is something like this. This is uh, equal to sine of kx, right? So what happened here, I combine two eigenfunctions uh, and that was fine for t. Why? Because the eigenvalues are formed for t as a k squared. And one k is positive k, another k is negative k. So the square doesn't care really, right? So you can combine these two eigenfunctions. And so in reality, there is this k square eigenvalue that uh, the, the corresponding eigenfunctions, they span the whole, the whole two-dimensional subspace, which is formed by all, any possible linear. If you, if you have any possible linear combination of two functions, it's still an eigenfunction of t squared, because t squared doesn't care whether it's a k squared or minus k squared, right? So any linear combination of these two functions will be an eigenfunction of t, but it doesn't work for p. So you see the degeneracy that we got in one operator screws up the, uh, the eigenfunctionness of the another operator, right? Because, because of the degeneracy, I was able to come up with a function which is an eigenfunction of one operator and it's not an eigenfunction of another operator. So then you need to make a right choice so that I can choose the same set for two operators at the same time. And the right choice would be pick the exponents instead of linear combinations of exponents. So could, could you make a rule if either of the operators have only, uh, differentiate only one, so it's d over dx, not d squared over dx, then you would always use an e, a function with uh, e in it? Well, the problem with making such rules is that if we, the exponents are not convenient functions uh, for, say if you have boundary conditions, right? Then they're not, uh, they may not work uh, because we need that the function is decaying, say, at the boundaries of blocks, right? And the exponents, they just go uh, yeah, in a certain way and uh, that's, that, that may not work. But the whole point here is that this non-degeneracy condition, if you're operators are non-degenerate in the sense that they have a system of eigenfunctions which uh, all non-degenerate. So one eigenvalue, one function, Chris point that. Then uh, it's, it's pretty much straightforward to show that if you have a, some eigenfunction of one operator, it will be eigenfunction of another operator. And there's no ambiguity here. Whenever you start having degeneracies, there are choices you can make within that degenerate subspace for one operator, which may uh, end up being not eigenfunction for another, all right? So that's why the theorem, the more general theorem says, you can always find such eigenfunctions, which will be eigenfunctions of both operators. Find is the keyword here, but not arbitrary eigenfunction of one operator will be eigenfunction of another operator. So there is a subtlety here. Right? And the more extended
proof would be to show that there is always a choice you can make within that degenerate subspace so that there is always possibility that you can find such set of eigenfunctions which will be common, even in the degenerate situation. But in for non-degenerate, it's, it's very straightforward. Okay? All right. Any more questions? Yes, we are kind of running out of time. Yeah. Contrast one more time uh, the difference between degenerative and non-degenerative. So for uh, for essentially this is non-degenerate case where if you have uh, two eigenfunctions, two eigenfunctions which are different. Uh, here we start with the fact that uh, psi n is different from psi k, right? So two different eigenfunctions for the same operator a necessarily they should give two different eigenvalues. A n cannot be equal to A k, right? So that is non-degenerate case. In the kinetic energy operator case uh, for T, if you start with this function, I k x, or you start with a function which is exponent of minus I k x, these are two different functions, yes. but because T when it acts on them, it doubly differentiates, so it always will end up with the eigenvalue, which is uh, k squared, proportional to k. So then this condition will not be satisfied that the eigenvalues are different for two functions which are different. So that is a degenerate case. Okay, so two different functions must have two different eigenvalues for non-degenerate case. And uh, if the case is degenerate, then they, they may have the yeah the same eigenvalue. And the particle in a three-dimensional box was an exa another example where we had different functions, but the same energies, essentially. A whole bunch of them. OK, yeah, so those, those energy levels were considered degenerate. That's right. No. Yeah, so and then how many of the, of the same energy, that's the degeneracy. That's okay, the yeah, number yeah. that. Uh, you sometimes may be asked, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no, not not much of that. The proofs I uh, usually don't ask, uh, but what you will be, you may be asked is like, okay, here are two operators. Uh, can they possibly have the same? Or if can we, if we measure, can we get the same? Uh, well, can we get with a certainty? results of the measurements for, for both, uh, right? But I'll give you examples of the midterms, uh, okay? So you'll yeah. be able to work out. Uh -huh. Okay, good. <laughs>